All right, let's get started. Um, so I think, uh, just at a glance, it looks like there are more people here for part two than, than we're here for, uh, for part one. And I think, mostly anyway, this is a proper superset of the folks who are here for, for part one. Um, uh, just quickly, for the benefit of, uh, of those of you who, who are not here for part one, uh, my name is Jeff Brown, and I work for Pivotal. I work on the Grails development team, so I spend most of my time working on the, on the Grails, helping, helping build the, the Grails framework. And uh, so, so what we talked about uh, in, in part one is uh, we talked about a number of, of Groovy's uh, really powerful and really flexible uh, runtime metaprogramming capabilities. We talked about uh, things like uh, using uh, special MOP methods like set property and get property to intercept property access uh, dynamically at runtime. Uh, we talked about um, uh, closure delegates and uh, expando meta classes, where you can say something like string dot meta class dot method name equals closure. We talked about things you can do at runtime to modify the behavior of uh, of, of classes, at, uh, modify the behavior of, of objects at uh, at runtime, and all that is really powerful and really flexible and, and uh, really great stuff. Um, but I want to, um, at least uh, to a large extent, move away from that now for, for, the, for part two here and talk about, uh, still about metaprogramming. Um, we're talking about changing the behavior of your program, but I want to talk about compile time metaprogramming, which is, opens up lots of interesting possibilities that uh, cover a lot of the same ground as runtime metaprogramming, but also covers uh, uh, some additional scenarios, and we'll, we'll talk about some of that. Um, so metaprogramming is uh, uh, writing programs that modify programs. So all the stuff we looked at in part one is we were writing programs that modified a program at runtime. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in this session, but uh, primarily what I'm going to focus on is writing programs that modify programs at compile time. Really, we're kind of writing, we're, we're going to look at uh, writing a compiler in a, in a sense. You're not really writing a compiler, but you're writing code. We're going to see how you can write code that gets to participate in the compilation process. Um, so that's a lot of what we're going to talk about. So before I jump right into the compile time stuff, I want to uh, review one quick thing that uh, we talked about in the last session and maybe some of you are already familiar with. Right, so if I, wh what that code does is it adds a, uh, a method to the string class called do something. And uh, so now when I run this program, that code, the print line in do something on line two gets executed three times, right? So what's happening on line one there is I'm adding a method to the string class, and the method is called do something. And the closure uh, line two there is, is the implementation of the do something method. That's a, a really simple, really powerful way to add methods to classes at runtime in Groovy. There's all kinds of interesting ways to take advantage of that. Uh, the Grails framework does it all over the place. It's, it, it's a, a really common thing, happens a lot. Uh, so it's really powerful and it's a great feature of the, of the language. One limitation of that is that uh, what, what we're really doing here um, with lines one through three is we're giving some information to the Groovy runtime and telling it, anytime someone invokes the do something method on a string, do this, right? And instead of do something, we could uh, be replacing an existing method. We could do, you know, something like that. So there's a real method in the string class called trim. And uh, so now we're replacing that existing method. An issue with that, or, or something to be aware of when you use this style of, of metaprogramming in Groovy, is that change applies to your whole program but only applies to the parts, of, so it doesn't really apply to your whole program, I guess. It, it applies to all the Groovy code in your program, but only the Groovy code in your program. So I want to be clear about what I'm saying there. So the string class is written in Java, right? Java.lang.string is a Java class. And you can write your own Java classes as part of your project and use this exact same approach to modify the behavior of that Java class at runtime. But those changes only apply to interactions that are initiated from Groovy, right? So the code that we're looking at here in the editor, this is Groovy code. It's interacting with an instance of a class that's written in Java, but this is Groovy code that we're looking at. And every time you make a method call from Groovy, that's a request to Groovy's runtime dispatch mechanism to say, hey, here's an object, and here's a method name, and maybe here's some arguments. Uh, try to make something good happen with that, right? So since this call is coming from Groovy, Groovy is going to be able to recognize that this has happened, right? Lines one through three. So instead of line seven throwing a missing method exception, instead of that, 
the code that's, that's defined there on line two gets executed, but that, that's Groovy's runtime, dis, runtime dispatch mechanism making that happen, that only applies to calls that come from Groovy. So in Java, well in Java, I couldn't even call the do something method, right? My code wouldn't compile. But if I were replacing an existing method like that, from Java, when I call the trim method, the real trim method is going to be executed. There's, this doesn't, none of this stuff on lines one, two, and three has anything to do with calls that come from Java, right? So that's one of the limitations of using this kind of a approach for, for doing metaprogramming in Groovy is changes like this only apply to invocations that come from Groovy, right? What, uh, what we're going to spend most of our time talking about uh, uh, in this session is compile time metaprogramming, where you're doing things, uh, you're modifying classes as the classes are being compiled. And one of the interesting aspects of that is because it's happening at compile time, you're actually affecting the bytecode that's generated in your .class files. So now when you if, you, if you add a method to a class at runtime using this technique, the do something method is not accessible from Java. If you wrote Java code that tried to call do something, the code won't even compile because there is no do something method in the string class. And we have to turn this into a Groovy class here. So if, if I were to add a method called do something to a Groovy class, right? Person is a Groovy class, we'll say, uh, using this technique, again, I can only call this method from, from Groovy. But if instead of using this technique, if I added the do something method to the person class at compile time, so I'm not doing what you see on lines one, two, and three, and we're going to do what we're going to describe later in the session. If I add that method at compile time, now the person.class file, the, the real class file that, that corresponds to the person class, has the do something method in it. And whatever code is in here is inside of that do something method. It's really in the bytecode. So I can call that from Java. I can call it from Scala. I can call it from Clojure. I can call it from Groovy. It's a real method in the class. Um, just like real methods that are added that you define in your source code, right? Except instead of the do something method being defined in source code like this, right? Instead of saying def do something, if you do that, obviously the do something method is going to be in the bytecode, but we're not going to do that. We're going to talk about things you can do at compile time to add a do something method to the person class that do something method is in the bytecode and it can be called from anywhere. And that's one of the fundamental differences between doing runtime metaprogramming in Groovy and doing compile time metaprogramming. The compile time stuff ends up in the bytecode and can be accessed from any language. The runtime stuff only applies to calls that come from Groovy. Questions or comments about that kind of foundation laying there? Is good? All right. Uh, I am not going to look at, uh, we're not going to go through a whole bunch of slides here. We've got uh, maybe one or two slides to just sketch out some ideas. We're going to spend most of our time in an IDE and uh, uh, doing some uh, hopefully fun stuff. Um, so I'm going to start, we're going to get to a point where we're going to write our own compile time transformation. We're going to write some code that gets executed at compile time. But before we do that, I want to introduce, uh, introduce some ideas um, that relate to compile time transformations that are provided by Groovy out of the box. Um, so we'll look at uh, some transformations that are supplied by the language, and then we'll look at how to write our own. Um, so at compile time, w one of the things that the compiler is doing is it's reading your source code, right? So you, you wrote uh, source code that looks something like, uh, something like this, right? The compiler has to parse this file, right? It's a bunch of characters in a file. The compiler has to parse that and try to make sense of it. Right? So when the compiler is doing that, it's creating a model in memory that represents what you've expressed here. So um, it, it's a tree. It's, a, it's called an abstract syntax tree, an AST, an abstract syntax tree. And that tree represents all the stuff you've expressed in your source code. So for example, at some point during the compilation process, there'll be a class node that represents the person class. And in that class node will be, um, so, so if we had a method here, there will be a method node, and the method node has information about this method. It, the method node encapsulates the name of the method, the types of arguments, the return value, all the code that's in the method. So the compiler is reading these characters in, in a file, right? It's reading your source, source files and parsing it and trying to make sense of it, and then creating a model in memory that represents this class. So you've got class nodes and method nodes and field nodes and, and statements and expressions. Everything that's represented in your source code is represented in this model that's created in memory. And that model is, is known as, the, uh, as an abstract syntax tree, 
right? It's a tree of stuff that represents what you've described in your source code. Uh, that's what an AST is. An AST transformation is, uh, is what it sounds like. It's a thing that transforms an AST. So the compiler creates this AST, creates a model of your classes in memory at compile time. AST transformations get an opportunity to look at that model and potentially mutate it, do stuff with it, right? Add methods to the classes or remove methods or add statements to existing, you get to do lots of interesting things inside of an AST transformation. There are a number of uh, transformations provided by Groovy. This is just a small subset, some that I just uh, picked somewhat arbitrarily. Uh, we'll talk about uh, one or two of these and then we'll look at writing our own transformation. So let's go look at, um, let's do this. So I'm gonna create a, uh, create a new class that I will just call widget. Do I already have a widget class? No widget class, so we'll do that. And I'll say, and this is something that uh, uh, developers do quite a bit, a bit of. In fact, someone asked me about this exact thing in the break between parts one and two. Uh, so you might want to do something like this. You might want to have a, a private property that's a map, some properties equals that. And you might want to have this class implement map. So now what you've got to do is this, right? So because this class implements map, it has to provide an implementation for every method that's in the map interface. That's just the way the compiler works, right? If you write a class that implements an interface, this class has to implement all the methods that are defined by the interface. So now what I might want to do is uh, delegate all of these things to some properties. Some properties dot size, some properties that is empty, and I'm not going to go through all these, but you get the idea, right? So I'm writing a class that wants to delegate to a map. So I've got this private property that is the map I want to delegate to. And uh, because I want the widget class to behave like a map, I want it to look like a map, I want it to be a map, I've expressed that the widget class implements the map interface. Uh, so I have to provide all these methods. And all these methods are really just going to be one line methods that delegate to the some properties thing. And maybe there's a special case, like for contains key, I want to do something like this. So I want to say boolean contains it equals some properties dot uh, contains key key. Uh, and then if some condition, right, under some circumstances, I might want to just say contains it equals true. So, so I've got some logic that I want to impose here, right? So don't be distracted by whatever the, the actual, but I've got some, something I want to impose here that is more than just delegating to the original map. Right, so uh, most of these methods are just going to be one-liners that delegate to the original map or delegate to some properties, but maybe one or two of these or maybe a bunch of them have some special behavior that I, that I want to introduce. This is a fairly common pattern that folks do a lot of, right? In Groovy, you don't want to do all that, right? So we'll get rid of all this, do, 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 do. right? Let's get back to, we don't want to implement the map interface and I'm just going to mark this class, uh, this property like that. All right, so I've written a class. The class does not implement the map interface. Right? It doesn't say widget implements map. I haven't defined methods like put and get and contains key and entry set and all that stuff. I've declared a property uh, called some properties. It has to be statically typed. You, you can't do this. It's got to be statically typed. We'll see why that's important in a moment. Um, and what the, and I've annotated that property with that delegate. Um, so what uh, delegate is, is it's, uh, it's an annotation provided by Groovy that triggers an AST transformation. So one way to trigger AST transformations is with an annotation, and that's what we're doing here, and we're going to write our own version of this later and see how that works. One way to trigger an AST transformation is with an annotation. What this particular annotation does is it triggers a transformation that will look at this property, and in particular, it'll look at the, the static type, the static declared type of the property, and the transformation will add a bunch of stuff to the class node, the widget class node, based on that. One of the things that the transformation is going to do is it's going to make this class implement map, right? We don't have to type that, but it will. And uh, let's, uh, let's go out here. Projects, great, compile time, app. What I want to do is uh, I want to look 
Java p minus class path bin com dot demo dot widget. Okay, so I've just run Java p to see what the widget class looks like. Remember, this is what our source code looks like for the widget class, right? It doesn't implement map. There are really no methods in the class. We've just declared a property and marked that property with that delegate. But if we go look at what the compiler generated there, there's a bunch of stuff here. Well, here, let's, uh, let me comment that out first. Let's, let's run this again and see what the class looks like. So that's the whole class. There's, there's a bunch of methods that Groovy adds for uh, different reasons. But notice there are not methods here like get and put and contains key and entry. There's nothing here that relates to maps. Um, but if I mark this property with that delegate and come back here and run Java P again, what we're going to see is there, there are a bunch of methods here. There, uh, we see the clear method, the contains key method, contains value, entry set. Those are all methods that are defined in the java.util.map interface. Um, notice that our class implements map, right? Even though we didn't express that in our source code, at least not explicitly, we didn't say widget implements map. What we said is widget has a property of type map and widget wants to delegate to that thing. That's what the annotation was about. The AST transformation created all this stuff for us. And the code inside of those methods is doing something like this, right? It's saying get string key, some properties dot get key. Right? That was, so we can write that source code, but the compiler generated that for us. The only reason we might want to implement our own version of the get method is if we had some special rules here. So we want to do something like, um, uh, for whatever reason, we want to convert this string to uppercase before we pass it on to the, the, the real map. Um, so the, the pattern, what, what you normally would do with this is you would declare the property, give it a static type, uh, so the compiler knows what you're trying to delegate to. Mark the property with that delegate. The compiler makes this class implement this interface and generates all the methods that are in the interface and adds those methods to this class. And they're all basically one-liners that delegate to this thing. If the method already exists in this class, then instead of replacing it with the one-liner, Grivy will respect the one that you wrote and leave it there. And that's what allows you to override you know, provide your own implementation of the get method if you want, for, for example. Right. Does that make sense? So any comments or questions about any of that? Yeah. Well, uh, Yeah, well, why not? So the question is, um, can you delegate to a final class? And what final means with respect to classes is uh, you cannot write a subclass which we're not doing that, right? So yes, you, you can delegate to a, f to a final class. But, but would my widget then implement what, the interface of the string or the? It will, in fact. So if we did this. So in the, simple, in the, the first example, um, so I said you had to have to statically type this property, and you do. In this case, the, the type is, uh, is an interface. Java.util.map is an interface. And what the transformation is going to do with that is it's going to make this class, the widget class, implement all the methods of that interface. If the thing is a class, so the fact that string is final doesn't have anything to do with this. Um, string is final, but what I'm about to say would be true even if string were not final. What the compiler is going to generate for that is the widget class will now implement all of the interfaces that this class implements. So let's go look at what the compiler generated there. So now we'll see com.demo.widget implements char sequence, comparable, serializable. Those are all interfaces that the string class implements. Uh, the, the more common thing is for this to, to be an interface, but if it, if it is a class, that's, that's still fine. And the compiler will make the class you're writing here, the widget class, implement all the same interfaces that this thing implements. Does that make sense? Does that address your question? Good. Yeah. Can you use delegate multiple types? Like um, delegate to a map and fill this? What happens to our proposition? Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is, can you delegate to numerous things? And the answer is yes. So let's, uh, let's look at some of that. Um, let's do this. I'm going to introduce my own interfaces here. But, uh, I want to have control over, over this. So we'll say interface 1. Uh, Interfa uh, yeah, interface, interface two. All right, so here I've, I've got uh, a couple of diff different interfaces to find there. Uh, 
And now I want to delegate to an interface one. And I also want to delegate to an interface two. All right, so we're, we're gonna have to go through this in a couple different steps, but let's just start with that. So the widget class doesn't implement any interfaces. It's got two properties, uno and dos, uh, that are uh, statically typed to be interface one and interface two. Interface one has this method, interface two has this method. Now, if we look at what the compiler generated, we get a one and a two method right here. Uh, again, wh what I'm doing out here on the command line is all I'm doing is running Java P. That's a standard Java static profiling tool that'll tell you some information about the class. So uh, the one and the two methods are there, and they're one-liners that uh, just call, so it's like this, right? Just says uno.1, right? Same with the other one. Uh, and also, in addition to, to those methods being there, the widget class implements both of these interfaces, interface one and interface two. So far, so good. Let's do this. All right, uh, well, let's, let's come up here. Let's say void one uno dot one. That's what the compiler's generating for that. What should the compiler generate for that, I wonder? And maybe that's uh, part of what you had in mind with the question. Now, how does, uh, you know, what, what should be in here is really the question. Should it be uno.1? Should it be dos.1? Should it be uno.1? And do, what should happen there? So let's get rid of that method and see what the compiler is generating for that. Uh, well, we can't tell from looking at that. Let's look at... Um, we'll take a quick look. I don't know if this is going to be easy to look at or not. If, uh, if it is, we'll talk about it. And if not, I'm going to jump ship on this. Uh, where are we here? We want... Great. Compile time. App. Bin. Com demo widget. Now, if we look in the, uh, that is not what I expected to see there. Actually, let me. S do I have a typo here? No, no, one, one, one. <laughs> uh, so I'm surprised at what's happening there. To be honest with you, why is it doing that? I'm going to get back to you. Uh, let's follow up with that after the session. I don't want to take a bunch of time exploring that right now. I, th I expected. I did not expect that to work, but it did. So if we leave the, uh, the duplicate methods out of the equation for now, that's the part that surprised me. You can delegate to as many things as you like, right? In our case, we're delegating to an interface one, interface two. The transformation is going to make this class implement all those interfaces and generate all the method, corresponding methods. Uh, what I think is happening, again, I'm not gonna take more than 15 seconds here and then we'll get back to what I think uh, the transformation is doing is it's probably, it may be delegating to the first one that's declared in your source code here, but yes. yeah, is that what's happening? Yes. There you go. Th that makes sense to me. Okay, good. Other qu questions or comments about this so far? Right, so you just declare properties and mark that you want to delegate to those properties uh, and the compiler generates a whole bunch of stuff for you. So what, what's happening is this annotation is causing a particular AST transformation to be uh, applied to, to this class, to that property in particular. And that AST transformation can do all kinds of cool stuff. And what this particular AST transformation is doing is all the stuff we just talked about. But transformations can do arbitrary stuff, right? And we're gonna, we'll look at uh, other interesting examples and then write our own, which is, uh, which is really quite cool. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's mark this class as a singleton. And we'll say string one, uh, string name, integration. All right, so why is singleton not? All right, uh, yeah, that looks good. So I've annotated this class with, uh, with that singleton. Let's look and see what the compiler generated for that. All right, uh, one of the things that happened is, I need to turn on private here to see it. All right, the constructor in this class should be private. There it is right there, All right? Private com.demo.widget. So this class has a private constructor. So you can't create instances of the widget class now. It's a singleton. You shouldn't be able to create uh, instances. The uh, compiler added this get instance method that's a static method, and it returns uh, an instance of the widget class. So the way to retrieve, the, the way to get a reference to the singleton instance of the widget class is to invoke that method. 
And Java developers are used to writing singletons and you write all that code yourself or you let the IDE generate it for you. IDE, some of the IDEs have templates to, to generate all that code for you. Uh, but in, in Groovy, that's a super simple thing, right? You write your class. Generally, you write it the way you would write any, write a normal class. Don't worry about the fact that it's going to be a singleton. Just write the class, declare the properties and methods that you want, and then annotate the class with java.lang.singleton, and that triggers an AST transformation that, uh, that does some interesting stuff, like makes the, the constructor private. It adds the get instance method. Um, so that, that's another example of a, a practical application of an AST transformation. Right? That's saving you from writing a bunch of tedious code that you might or might not get right. Questions about that? Uh, package scope is, uh, is kind of an interesting thing. So in, in Groovy, if you don't specify an access specifier when you declare a property, for example, the, it, it means something different than it would in Java. So when you, when you do this in Java, in line six, what you're declaring is a package level property, a package level field called name, and that's it. No, there's, there's no get name, there's no set name, there's just a field called name, and it's a package level field, right? There are four access specifiers that are your options. You've got private, protected, package, and public. Uh, the way to specify that something is package level in Groovy is you leave the access specifier off. In Groovy, when you leave the access specifier off, that means something different. Uh, in Groovy, when you leave the access specifier off, that means you want to declare a public property. And what a public property means is you get a private field and you get a public method called getName and a, another public method called setName. Right? You get all that. You get a private field and a public getter and a setter. Uh, but you would never write all that code in Groovy, right? In Groovy, the normal thing is to do this, and the compiler generates all that for you. So let's look at uh, the bytecode here and verify that. So here we've got the private string called name, right? And we've got a public method called get name, and just below that is another public method called set name. So the default, if you leave the access specifier off, is different in Groovy than it is in Java, right? When you leave it off in Java, you get a package level member. And when you leave it off in Groovy, you get a private field and public getters and setters. So what if you wanted to declare a package level member in Groovy? There's, there's, no, there's no syntax to do that in the, in, the, in the language, but there is an AST transformation to do that. And that is uh, you can annotate the thing with package scope and that causes that to happen, right? You get a package level member instead of uh, what we just described. Questions about those, just uh, maybe even not those particular transformations, just in general, what's going on? All is good? All right. Let's uh, move on to the really fun stuff. All right. Why do we have, there's a widget class we don't want there. All right. Let me go out here and delete the widget class that I created earlier. That's going to be a conflict. There we go. All right. So let's look at this uh, spec that I've called uh, magic spec. We'll see why it's called magic in a minute. All right. So I've got a class called widget. And I've got a test here that creates an instance of the widget class and then asserts that when I retrieve the value of the magic number property, that its value will be 42, right? Here's the widget class. There's no magic number property there. Uh, let's run our test and our test should fail and it did. And in particular, it failed with a missing property exception. No such property magic number for class com.demo.widget. This right here is throwing an exception because I'm referring to a property that does not exist. Right? And in part one, we, we talked about several ways that uh, we could maybe intercept that property access at, at runtime and, and do interesting things. Uh, what I want to explore now is how we can add the magic number property to, uh, to a class at compile time. In Grails, uh, we, do, we do a lot of this, right? So in Grails, when you declare um, a, uh, when you write a controller, inside of the controller, you can refer to properties like the request and the session and uh, things like that. But when the source code for your controllers don't declare any of those properties, you just write a class that's uh, underneath the Grails app slash controllers directory and you, you declare controller actions like this. And then you say def foo equals request dot, you know, uh, you can interact with the request. Um, but you don't declare the request property. It's not declared anywhere in your source code. You're not extending some other class and inheriting the request property, but somehow the request property is there. And that somehow 
is there is an AST transformation that you don't do anything to make it happen. In fact, you can't, not, you can't make it not happen. It's just going to happen. There's an AST transformation that gets applied to all of your controllers. And that AST transformation is adding the request property to the class. So in the bytecode for your controllers is a method called get request. Right? The, the real property is, is there in the bytecode. So from, if for some reason you had Java code in, in your Grails app that had a reference to one of your Grails controllers, that Java code could call get request because there's a, there's a get request method that an AST transformation has added to all of your controllers and a get response and a get uh, all the properties that you can access inside of a controller. Uh, most of those are added at compile time and that's what we're going to explore now is how does some of that work. So we want to add a property called magic number to the widget class and we want the value to be 42. At least initially that's what we'll start with. Right now again when I run this we get a missing property exception. So let's, uh, let's write an AST transformation that will help us um, uh, uh, dig into this a little bit. <laughs> Out here under the transform project Let's see, let's create an annotation. Yeah. I'm going to create a new annotation and we'll call it magic number. We want uh, the retention policy for this annotation to be runtime. And we want the target to be a type. All right, this is all standard Java annotation stuff here. There's nothing groovy about that. All we've done is we've written an annotation called magic number. In fact, I wrote it in Java. I, I could have written it in groovy. It doesn't matter. It's just an annotation, right? And I want to, over here in my spec, I'm going to annotate the widget class with at magic number, right? So we've annotated this class with the annotation that we just, just wrote. Our test is still going to fail. We haven't, haven't really done anything interesting yet, right? We still got a missing property exception. Uh, so what we want to do is write an AST transformation that supply, when, when you write AST transformations, there are a number of ways they can be triggered. Um, you can write what's called a global AST transformation, which is a transformation that gets applied to every single class that's being compiled, every class that's being compiled. So if you have a, a project that has two or 3,000 Groovy source files, and you write a global AST transformation, that global AST transformation is going to be applied to every single class. So maybe that's what you want, and maybe that's not. Um, so we're not going to look at writing uh, a global transformation. We're going to write a local transformation. And there, uh, one of the ways to trigger local transformations is with uh, annotations. So we're going to write a transformation that gets applied to all classes that are marked with at magic number, and only those classes. So one thing we won't have to do, when you write global transformations, transformations get applied to all classes, one of the things you end up doing is inside your transformation, you look at the class and see if it meets some criteria to see if you want to do whatever your transformation is going to do to that class. When you write a local transformation like this, you can skip that step. You know that your transformation is only applied to classes that you're interested in because your transformation is triggered by this annotation. So what we want to do is every class that's annotated with magic number we want to do some stuff too. So we introduce this annotation. We're going to introduce an AST transformation. Uh, we'll write this in Groovy. We could write it in Java, but uh, there's no good reason to do that right now. So we'll say magic number transformation. Good. Uh, we'll make this class implement AST transformation. All right, so this is uh, the beginning of our AST transformation. So this transfer, we want this transformation to be applied to all classes that are annotated with um, with at magic number. So over here on our magic number annotation, I can annotate this with groovy AST transformation <laughs> class com dot demo dot magic number transformation. So what this line of code is doing is telling the Groovy compiler transformation, that looks right. Uh, I'm sorry, say it again. Transform, yeah, I knew something didn't look right there. There we go. We would have seen that. Uh, so, oh, this is Java code, so I need double quotes here. All right, there we go. All right, what, uh, what that Groovy AST transformation class annotation says is this is telling the Groovy compiler that every class 
that's marked with this annotation. Every class that's marked with magic number should have this transformation applied to it. Magic number transformation, that looks right. Uh, and this is the transformation. So every class that's marked with, uh, with at uh, magic number is going to have, this will end up being executed for, for that class. And I'm gonna forego some error checking that you would normally have here. I'll, I'll describe it maybe briefly, but I'm, I'm gonna keep this as simple as we can. So it turns out that the second element in this array is going to be the class node that represents the class that was annotated with magic number. So in our case, uh, the second element in this array is going to be the widget class node, the class node that describes the widget class, right? Um, and we can do whatever we want to do with this class. So new, <coughs> uh, let's see, we want new method node, get magic number. We want this to be a public method. Um, we want it to return an integer. Something like that. Statement. Uh, all right. Is that right? No, class. Oh, I forgot the parameters. That's what I'm missing. New parameter. We're gonna, I'll describe what all that stuff is here momentarily. <laughs> so what we want to do is we want to create an instance of a class that's uh, part, of, uh, part of Groovy called a method node. And what a method node is, is it's a node in that AST. It's a node in the abstract syntax tree that represents a method. So one of the things we could do with that class node, uh, with a class node, is you can ask it, what are all the methods in this class? And you can iterate over them and, and do interesting things with them. Another thing you can do with a class node is you can add method nodes to it at compile time, and that's what we want to do. So we want to create a method node. Uh, I'm looking at the order of arguments here. No, statement code, okay, that's right. We want statement code, why is that? Let me see what the compiler error here is. Modifiers public. There it is right there. Class node, statement, method node, that's good. And we want parameter. Okay, good. All right, so we're creating a new method node. The first argument is the name of the method. So I want to create a method node that represents a method called get magic number. I want the uh, Packages it's java.lang that reflect. We want import java.lang that reflect that modifier, and this is singular modifier, not public. All right, so we want a method called get magic number. We want it to be a public method. We want it to. This is the return type. We want it to return an integer. Uh, this is the parameter list. We don't want our method to support any parameters, so that's an empty parameter array. Uh, this null argument is, uh, has to do with uh, exceptions that this method might throw, and we don't want it to throw any exceptions, so that's null. And code is the stuff that's going to be inside the method. We need to create that in a moment. We'll get to that. New method equals that. All right. So now we've got, uh, we're, we're creating a method node and adding... Uh, uh, defining it per those uh, per those parameters. I'm trying to get this so it's easy to look at, and it's actually there. We go. All right. So we've created a new method node, and then at the end of the line, what we want to do is we want to add that method node to class node. And remember, class node is going to be the widget class. It's going to be whatever class is annotated with magic number. Add method, new method, just like that. All right, so all that's missing now is what's on line 20, where it says statement code equals null. We need some code to put inside this method. We don't want the code to be null. We need, to, we need, to, need there to be code. And this could be arbitrarily complicated. Anything you can do in Groovy code, in source code, um, so if statements and return statements and adding, th anything you can do in code, there's a way to describe that uh, with AST nodes. Um, what I want to do is just keep this super simple. So our statement is just going to be a single statement that is a return statement. New return statement, and I want it to return constant expression 42, just like that. All right, and I lost my parameter here. So we've got uh, our code has just one uh, uh, our code is a statement. It's a return statement, and it returns the literal 42. 
right? returns a constant expression 42. We could write code here that calculates the magic number. We could do arbitrarily complicated stuff, but I want to keep it, keep it simple just like that. So now what's going to happen is anytime I, I annotate a class with a magic number, the compiler knows that that class should have this AST transformation applied to it, right? Because of line 12 here. What that AST transformation is doing is uh, creating a new method called get magic number. Uh, it's public, returns an int, and, and the, ma the method has, this is all the code that's inside the method. It's just a return statement that returns literal 42. We've created that method and added that method to the class node. So let's, uh, let's see if we got all that right. Run this. There we go. And our test passed. So let's just, uh, to make sure we're... So I'm, I've changed the AST transformation now. So instead of returning 42, it's going to return 2112. And now our test should fail. And it did, right? That, so I, I made that change just to prove that we really are executing the code that... Uh, the AST transformation is doing what it's purported to do. Uh, so now the test is passing again. So uh, again, quick pass through that. We wrote an annotation called magic number. We express that every class that's annotated with the magic number should have this transformation applied to it. That transformation is doing this stuff, right? Creating a method and adding it to that class. And uh, now in our test, we've annotated the widget class with um, uh, add magic number. So the AST transformation we just talked about uh, applies to that uh, applies to that class. Uh, questions about any of that so far? It's good. All right. So as I said before, all over the place, this same sort of thing is happening inside of uh, inside of Grails. So when you call a method on a domain class, like um, if person were a domain class and you called get forty two, that get method is added to the person class at compile time. Uh, because we've, we've got an AST transformation that looks, you know, that does basically the same sort of stuff, but it's applied to all of your domain classes. And what that AST transformation is doing is adding a get method and adding a list method and adding a whole bunch of GORM methods to all of your domain classes. All of the stuff that we can add to, to your domain classes and services and controllers and tag libs, all the stuff that we can add to your artifacts at compile time are added at compile time in recent versions of Grails. Uh, in the beginning, uh, before Grails... Uh, uh, before Grails 2, all of the metaprogramming that, that Grails did had to be done at runtime. It was all runtime metaprogramming. Uh, and then when Groovy introduced AST transformations to, to be able to do this sort of, sort of thing at compile time, we started taking advantage of that. So all the things that can be done at compile time, like a method like get and list, are now done at compile time. But there's still stuff that has to be done at runtime, like find all by uh, age greater than. Right? That's an example of a method that we can't really create at compile time. Um, we kind of could. So we could look at the person class and notice that there's an age property and also notice that it's a number, that it's an integer. And with that, uh, we could generate this method at compile time. But it turns out that's not practical because you can use ands and ors. So it could be find all by age greater than and last name in list and email, there's just uh, uh, the more properties you have in your domain class, the more combinations of dynamic finder methods you, you might uh, come up with. So the, we don't generate any of that stuff at compile time. That's all managed at runtime. And the way it's managed at runtime is instead of, so, so, so what Grails is doing is something like this. Static dot method missing equals that. So we uh, add a static method missing method to all of your domain classes. And what that method missing method does is looks at the method name, string method name args, and parses the method name. So if the method name begins with find all by, then a bunch of stuff happens. And if it begins with count by, then a bunch of other stuff happens. Um, but all that has to be sorted out dynamically at runtime. Uh, it can't be done at compile time just because of all the combinations and permutations that I uh, alluded to a moment ago. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, could, could there be an AST transformation that looked for this line of code, and as a result of that, <coughs> add the find all by age greater than to the person class? 
That's the question, right? The answer is yes, it could, kind of. Um, there would be limitations if that were done. Uh, one of the limitations of that is not all of these co calls are going to be available at compile time. So for example, if you're writing a plugin, you don't know what methods the application is going to invoke on domain classes that are in your plugin. So maybe there are some, some pieces of that that could be sorted out and done at compile time. But uh, yeah, none of, none of the dynamic finders are done at compile time. It's all done uh, dynamically at runtime. Uh, there are benefits to doing these things at compile time. One is performance, right? At, at runtime, uh, things that are in the bytecode, real methods that are added at compile time are more performant than doing Groovy's dynamic dispatch stuff at runtime. So performance is a reason to prefer compile time uh, uh, metaprogramming over runtime metaprogramming. Another benefit to compile time metaprogramming is you're, we're talking about adding real methods to the dot class files. So in, uh, back in our, our widget magic number business, the widget class really does have a method in it called um, get magic number in the dot class file. Uh, so I can call that method from, uh, from Java or Scala or Clojure or from any JVM language. That's not true of methods that I add using runtime metaprogramming. So there are benefits to doing uh, uh, these, this kind of metaprogramming at compile time over doing it at runtime, but there are some things that can't be done at compile time. Dynamic finders are a good example of that, right? There's just so many combinations that uh, we have to do some of that at, at, at runtime. So depending on what you're doing and what, what kinds of methods you're trying to add to classes and when and where they're going to be called, uh, a number of factors will help you decide whether something is a better candidate for runtime metaprogramming or compile time metaprogramming. But uh, this introduction here, and, and AST transformations are a giant complex. There's all kinds of crazy stuff you can do with AST transformations. We've looked at like the first 2% here. Uh, I just want to introduce the idea and give you a sense for a little bit about what this looks like. Uh, AST transformations can get really complicated and really tedious. Uh, you really have to be careful about uh, what you're doing. Uh, you can generate invalid code with AST transformations. Um, you're still subject to the verifier at runtime, so you're not going to be able to just go haywire and do like pointer uh, manipulation and stuff. Um, but you can generate stuff that won't pass the verifier. If you, if you generate, uh, there are things you can do in an AST transformation that put stuff in the DAT class file that will not be considered valid at runtime, and you'll get verifiers to, to tell you that that went wrong. So the, you're still subject to the boundaries that the JVM imposes, and that's a good thing. You can't just go haywire and do crazy stuff. But you can, uh, you, if your AST transformations get complicated, uh, get, get very sophisticated, you can, uh, it can get complicated and hard to look at, and you can end up, uh, they can be tricky to, to work on and tricky to debug. Uh, but it's a really powerful feature, right? In the framework, we, we use it all over the place. I think it's a practical thing for lots of applications to take advantage of. Certainly, it's a practical thing for applications to take advantage of. And for some applications, it'll be practical to write your own AST transformations to solve problems. But where it really shows up uh, most often is in frameworks, right? Grails does it all over the place. Uh, and lots of other Groovy frameworks will uh, uh, do the same sort of thing. Comments or questions about any of the AST transformation stuff? Yes? Say, uh, you mean here? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, instead of hard coding this here to return 2112, could I get that code from someplace else? And you could, but you're, you're sort of on your own. And it turns out Grails does a lot of this. So in Grails, we've got this kind of this apparatus that we use where um, we write classes. Uh, let's see, I don't have the Grails sort. Let's do this. Quickly, I'm going to see if I can pull up GitHub. And we are out of time, so let me do this really quickly, and then we'll, I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. Uh, uh, but, so I'm looking at source code inside of uh, Grails core here. So there's a class that happens to be called controllers API. And the controllers API has, class has methods like um, get request, I'm trying to find uh, get request in particular, just because that's one, or redirect, OK. So in a controller, you can call redirect, and something happens. What we've got inside the, the framework is an AST transformation that will go through this controllers API class, which is what we're looking at here. And for every method defined in this class, 
we add a corresponding method to your class. So this method basically gets added to your controller class. So now we're writing the real logic in code. And then we've got this apparatus that finds this class and uses this to decide what gets added to your controller. So if, if I added another method to this class right here, the next time we compiled your controller, your controller would have that method. So that's not really a feature of AST transformations. That's, again, some apparatus that we built specifically inside the framework. Uh, to do that. So you can get there, but you have to kind of manage some of that on your own. Traits are uh, a new feature of Groovy that, uh, that do that. So you can write a trait and then um, the same sort of thing happens without having to write your own apparatus for that. Let me do this. So we are out of time. I'm happy to talk about this all day. So if you've got questions, please come uh, let me know. But those of you who want to uh, uh, go get a drink or whatever, uh, thank you all very much.